Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Thanks for showing up. And, um, you know, just before everybody's still coming in, finding a seat, you know, uh, Sunday night was so much fun having the baptism. And if you were there, you know how much fun it was. If um, you weren't there, maybe you grabbed some, we posted a bunch of photos on uh, I don't know. Where were they posted? Facebook? Social, somewhere on social media. I, I don't know. I, obviously, I don't do that. So it was uh, uh, 14 people got baptized, and we had a great time afterwards in the pool and kids and families connecting, and it was just a special time. It's been a few years since we've been able to go down to the pool, and, and uh, it was nice to be back, and it just felt good. It just felt good to hang out as a church family, celebrating people's uh, just walk with the Lord, and and I got to, I'm going to share a little bit. Um, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody um, online, but this person knows who they are and they might be watching tonight and uh, they came down to meet me at the pool. And so if you're watching tonight, yes, I'm talking about you and I'm proud of you for what you did. And I want to share with everybody your story. I'm not going to share your name, but they've been watching online for months. They've never been in the building. They've, they've never come down here. They've never met me. And this person came into the pool because they heard that we were going to be there. And God has just radically been changing their life since they've been watching online. Sundays, Wednesdays, uh, downloading the notes. And God just prompted her to come down to the pool when they, she heard that we were going to be there. And she was nervous and scared, but she did it anyway. And she came in and sat down right next to me and introduced herself and told me her story. And I just want you to know, you know who you are. We love you and we love what God's doing in your life. And um, I think that's just a cool story. Amen. Huh? Amen. So you keep following Jesus, okay? And someday when you have the courage to be here, uh, in person, there is a family of people waiting to greet you so and love you, right? right. Amen. Amen. I mean, let's face it, walking through the doors of a church is scary, all right? It can be a scary thing. So uh, we want to try to remove that, that stigma. So God's doing all kinds of great things, and uh, he loves his church, and he loves to change the world through his church. And tonight, we're going to continue to talk about the book of Acts. Last uh, week, we talked about the first half of Acts. This week, we're going to talk about the second half of the book of Acts. It is a story of the Holy Spirit utilizing people, the church, uh, to get the gospel out there and see lives changed. And so that is what this is all about tonight. So let's pray. Let's dive in and uh, let's learn from the word of God tonight. So Father, thank you that you are in the business of changing lives. We're reading stories in the book of Acts of uh, missionary journeys and, and uh, how you used people like the Apostle Paul to start churches and change lives and draw people to yourself. And, and Lord, is it, is, it's exciting to see and to read these stories to see the examples that you've given to us in your word, but Lord, we're part of this. I mean, the stuff we're reading about tonight, 2,000 years later, your church is still moving. Your church is still advancing. Your church is still the plan, the program to change people's lives on planet Earth. And, and so, Lord, thank you that we have been invited into this wonderful partnership with you. It is amazing that we get to partner with you in this. So, Tonight, Lord, I, I pray that you would teach us. I pray you would give us perspective. I pray that you would help us connect the right dots. I, I, I pray, Lord, that you would light in us a passion for the job that is still yet to be done in our own generation. So, and thank you, Lord, that you are still changing lives, even through, through the live stream, through people watching. Oh, Lord, just thank you for that encouragement. So bless those that are watching on the live stream, those who watch it later, reach into their lives and, and change them as well, Lord, as you're changing us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so this is uh, the mission era. We're gonna go through uh, Acts 13 through 28 tonight. You might want to uh, get your, it's just funny to say get your Bibles out when it's your phone. Anyway, so get your phones out, your Bible app or, or, or whatever. Or if you actually have a hard copy, good for you. But I'm going to be reading off my phone here. So um, let's see here. I got I to make sure I'm in the right chapter. All right. 
So the expansion of the church, the first missionary journey. So we're going to start talking about Paul and him traveling around, his missionary journeys, and the expansion of the church uh, geographically. That starts in Acts 13 through 14. It says, Paul and Barnabas are chosen by the Holy Spirit, and they're sent out by the church. I just want to read that in uh, Acts 13, 2 through 3. And if you can follow along here and read through this with me, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting in the church in Antioch, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. <clears throat> so... What a great lesson it says here for the church, how the church is to operate. Our job is to listen and follow. Who, who chose the Apostle Paul? It was the Holy Spirit that chose Paul and Barnabas, not the church. The church didn't go, hey, you know, these guys are talented and these guys, these, these, these guys are great communicators. Therefore, hey, let's, let's start a missionary venture here. What the church did was recognize what God was doing and, and they agreed and they supported and again, I, I, I said this already, but again, it's a great lesson for how the church is to operate. And our job is to listen and follow. This is why we say all the time here at Foothills that, that we follow Jesus. Our job is to listen. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. That's what Jesus said. And, and I, I think some people take that and they spiritualize it. They over-spiritualize it. I, I take it very, very literally. I think Jesus still leads. I think Jesus still talks. I, I think Jesus still leads his church. He's the head of the church. I think if churches would spend a little more time asking Jesus what he wants them to do, I'm convinced he would tell them because he loves the church. I think often the church is in the business of telling Jesus what uh, we're going to do and, and then we ask him to bless it. And, and so and, and, and then other things. I mean, we, we say things like this here at Foothills. When you recognize what God is doing, you, you join him. You partner with him. Sometimes I think, again, I think we're always asking him to partner with us. Oh, no, it's our job partnering with him. It's, it's the other way around. You see the early church operated this way. The Holy Spirit's leading them. And that is the model for us to follow. So... They launched the, this, this missionary venture. It says their method was to start in Jewish synagogues. And so and you get down here. So what? They have a strategy. And, and so in verse 5, you see that they, they, there in the town of, of, of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogue. They preached the word of God. John Mark, and we'll get to him later here, uh, went with them as their assistants. So they had Paul and Barnabas and this young person they were bringing with them named John Mark, who they were training. So it says the method was to start in a Jewish synagogue. It, it's what Paul would have been familiar with, okay? He was a Pharisee. He was trained. He was a Jew. It was also the only place where people would have a working Old Testament knowledge of Scripture. In all of these towns... It, there were Jewish synagogues all throughout the Roman Empire. And so as Paul and Barnabas began to travel around, the very first thing they would look for is the Jewish synagogue. They knew that there would be, again, people there who had a working knowledge of the Old Testament because they're showing up there week after week, being taught the Word of God. They're listening to the Word of God. So let's start with people who understand the Word of God and let's start in the Old Testament and show them that Jesus is their Messiah. Made sense. It's a good strategy. After the Jews continued to refuse the gospel because they ran into opposition, Paul and Barnabas turned to focus their outreach to the Gentiles. So, so there's a shift in the strategy. I mean, it made sense to go to the Jews. They, they, they understand the Bible. Let's use the Bible. We can jump right into it. We can, we can lead them to Jesus. But in 44, so let's jump down to verses 44 here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple of these verses. So the, in verse 44, the following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them that preached the word of the Lord. But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, it was necessary that we first preach the word of God to the Jews. But since you have rejected it and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, ouch, we will offer it to the Gentiles. 
and then and, and they and they change. They change the strategy. Again, you look there in your notes, it says notice how the strategy changed when the former strategy was no longer effective. Sometimes um, I'm not trying to focus on us or, or uh, make anyone feel sorry for us, but sometimes we get criticized for strategy. Sometimes churches in general get uh, uh, criticized for, for strategies in trying to reach people. And, uh, you know, we, we've been on the receiving end of, uh, of some of that. But the reason that we change strategies is because sometimes things don't work. If there's nothing wrong with being pragmatic, we're trying to reach people. Jesus said, go make disciples. He told us what we're supposed to do. He didn't tell us how to do it. I mean, yeah, we teach them. We baptize them. I mean, there's things like that. But, but here's Paul and Barnabas, and they go out, and, and they're pursuing a strategy, and pretty soon that strategy is ineffective. And yet over here, there's a receptive audience. And so they pivot, and, and they, they offer the gospel to the Gentiles. And as you're going to see, it, people start getting saved. They start giving their life to Jesus. It actually works. It is just unfortunate that we are living in a day and an age when churches have to think about strategy. Our job is to reach people for Jesus. Here at Foothills, we say we reach, we equip, we transform. This is what we do. This is our calling. This is what God's called this church to do. And even now, after 25 years that we've been in existence, strategies change. We are coming out of a post-COVID world People have changed. Culture has changed. The churches that can pivot and, and discover ways to connect in this new world will be the ones who reach people for Jesus. The ones who don't are going to continue to become ineffective and more and more people are leaving the church. Folks, the, the data on people leaving the church is staggering. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It was actually, I shot a podcast today and that was the, that was the, the point of the podcast today. So, it's kind of on my mind and all the data. Some of this is the result of just churches being stuck in ineffective ways that no longer work. So, yeah, I guess I, I, I kind of said that there. Churches get stagnant, ineffective, irrelevant to culture when they embrace the same strategies for decades. What worked in the 70s didn't work in the 90s. What worked in the 90s doesn't work in the, the 2000s. And what, some, of, some of the things that worked pre-COVID, they don't work Post, the world's changed. Gospel doesn't change. Values don't change. Biblical principles don't change. But boy, how we offer them up, it changes. So, that's why I'm doing a podcast. Do I know anything really about podcasts? Nope. <laughs> don't ask me. There are people way more into that than I am. But I like to talk about Jesus, and I like to talk about Jesus in real life. And that's what the podcast is. It's called Real Life. Well, how, how do we follow Jesus in real life? So when we get ready to launch that, I think um, those of you that are into podcasts, I think it'll be tons of fun because it's kind of, uh, this is structured. It's kind of me with a co-host, Katie. She's the one making coffee back there. We do it together. So we're, we, uh, yeah, there, we're 30 years apart. It is a really fun dynamic to have a young person and an uh, older person, all right? <laughs> All right, okay, I got to get sidetracked. Here we go. Back to Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas see great response along with great opposition. So you, you start seeing that. People give their lives to Jesus and yet there's opposition. Huge results, but man, do they get persecuted. And so uh, Paul eventually gets stoned by an angry mob, okay? So, and then we're talking about rocks here, all right? In case there's any confusion about what we're talking about. Well, and you laugh about that, but if we were with a younger generation, I just might have to explain that, okay? <laughs> All right, 19 and 20. So Paul, they're preaching, they're teaching, then some Jews arise from Antioch. I mean, Antioch is where they started. They're following him. And Iconium, and they won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the town thinking he was dead. I mean, just picture the scene. They're angry. They, they surround him. They, they grab rocks and, and they pelt him with rocks. He passes out. They think he's dead. 
They drag him out of the town, thinking outside the city gates, and they just dump him there and walk off. Done with him. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up. Now, was he resurrected? Did he die? Some people say he did. Some people say he didn't. Doesn't say. Maybe he was just knocked unconscious. I, I don't know, all right? But it says the believers gathered around him. What were they doing? Probably praying. He got back up. Can you imagine the people? They just stoned this guy, drug him out, throw him outside the city gates. He gets up and he goes back in town. Anyway, I'm sure there were a lot of people giving their lives to Jesus after that, okay? So bloody, bruised. Now he's preaching again in the, in the city. Anyway, the next day he left, which was probably a good idea, all right? And moved on to the next city. Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch after a two-year journey. So this whole first part, their first couple chapters took two years. They went through a place called Galatia, uh, kind of southern Turkey. Uh, they report to the church what God had done. And so they go back and they report to the church and here's what happened, here's what took place, here's what God did and, and they, it was great rejoicing in that. So we're going to see three missionary journeys of Paul. And so there's the first one. Now we're going to go into the second one. The second missionary journey is Acts 15 through 17. But before this journey happened, there is a debate about whether or not the Gentile converts needed to practice Judaism as well as Christianity. So again, people were, Gentiles were giving their lives to Jesus, non-Jewish people. And I think it's very, very difficult for us to understand kind of the, the historical context here. So just there in your notes, I try to explain this very briefly. There was a great debate and tension within the non-Jewish people giving their lives to Jesus. Here's why. Many Jews accepted Jesus as their Jewish Messiah. Yes, yet still remained, retained their Jewish way of life and Old Testament practices. See, I, I think we think that all these people were, were giving their lives to Jesus and all of a sudden they walked away from Judaism. That, that's, not, that's not what was going on. That's not what was going on. The temple was still there. The sacrifices were still there. Their, their routines, all of that was still going on. They still believed in Jesus for their salvation. But, but this was part of their identity. The temple, the temple mount, all of that was part of who these people were. And now these Gentiles were getting saved and it's like, hey, wait a minute. They should be doing everything that we're doing. And then some, some people said, no, 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 they, they don't have to. And so there was this great debate going on. So it was until the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the city itself, that was 70 AD. We'll get to that at the end of this class. The temple life still, it dominated the Jewish life, even after they gave their lives to Jesus. In Acts 15, simplified the controversy Again, it's truly amazing how simplistic they made this. Uh, what, what did they, so the council in Jerusalem, the leaders of Jerusalem, after all this debate, they said, no, 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 let's not put that burden on them. We, 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 we don't want to do that. And they just said, hey, let's just tell them three things. Three things. Three things. They, they said, you know, <laughs> don't eat things sacrificed to idols. Don't eat anything or eat blood or drink blood. You go, ew, well, who would do that? Pagan rituals, okay? You're leaving all this paganism and you're coming into a, a different lifestyle. So this is, we were things that were normal to them. You have to walk away from this stuff and then stay away from being immoral. Just three things. Well, they made it simple. Anyway, Acts 15 simplified the controversy. It's truly amazing how simplistic they made this. It's unfortunate how often believers in Jesus separate from one another over minor differences of opinion rather than keeping the focus on Jesus. They, they wanted the focus on Jesus. They wanted to keep the focus on Jesus, following Jesus, listening to Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And it's just, it's incredibly unfortunate, I think, what is going on in the, in the, the church. You know, our whole world is so polarized. We, we take such an adversarial posture. Our world is and everything. I mean, everything. I mean, it, it's just... Politics, education, healthcare, and the, the church is just no different. It's no different. I, sometimes I, one of the reasons I struggle sometimes with social media, and we use it, and we should, and maybe it's, it's because of the things I click on, because you click on something, and then, then it's everywhere on your feed, right? And it's just like, oh my goodness. 
But there's just so much stuff on my feed where, you know, I, I click on some Bible stuff and religious stuff. And then what happens on my feed, I get all this stuff where Christians are fighting with each other. And it's just, it's disheartening because we believe something minor, something different. And we just, we just, we're just become adversaries and we play this out in front of everybody in the world. It's just, oh my goodness. It... Anyway, so I know, I digress. But since we're talking about the church tonight, something that I deeply, deeply love and deeply believe that it is the hope for this world will come through the church, his people. And I believe the church needs an awakening, a, a desperate awakening, because I'm not so sure we're representing Jesus the way we're supposed to. So, but that's another night, okay? So Paul and Barnabas... So Paul and Barnabas, before they go on the second missionary journey, this is kind of fascinating, and I love the fact that the Bible records this. Disagree. They disagree on taking, remember this kid named John Mark? So what happened during the first missionary journey, we didn't put it in your notes, we don't have time for this, but very quickly, they start this missionary journey. Missionary journeys are difficult and they're hard. John Mark... This young kid, eventually, uh, you know what? He struggled. He wanted to go home. And so he left them and went back home. And Paul and Barnabas uh, continued the journey. So now they're going to go on missionary journey number two. Let's go back to the churches. Let's go encourage them. Let's go back and, you know. And Barnabas wants to take along John Mark. Hey, Paul, remember that kid that deserted us? Listen, I want to take him and give him another chance. Paul says, not on your life. I will not take that kid with me. They disagreed so much. The disagreement was so sharp, they parted ways. Two godly men disagreed. How is that possible? Who's not following Jesus? Huh? Someone's wrong. Must be Paul. He's the passionate one. Always pick on the passionate people, right? See? Oh, my goodness. I am so glad this is included. Oh, let's, we should read it. Acts 15, 36. It's just good stuff. Why do I want to read this? Well, you'll see. <laughs> I'm going to make a point. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit other, each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to say, hey, let's take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus and Paul chose Silas, his new companion, and they left the believers entrusted him to the Lord, gracious care, and, and they went on a different direction. Huh. How can two people follow Jesus and have disagreements? Well, okay, a couple of things here. Even spiritual people can have major disagreements. It can happen. It happened right there. I appreciate the Holy Spirit included real life drama in the midst of the church developing. God uses real people who are not always perfect. But which one wasn't perfect? Well, they're both not perfect. We're all broken and flawed. So is Paul and Barnabas. So is John Mark. Here's the fascinating thing. God continued to, to, to use both of them and the new focus they that they took. God blessed them both. God blessed them both. Barnabas and Mark, they go to Cyprus. And God uses them there. Later on, John Mark becomes part of the story. Later on, later on, Paul asks John Mark to be part of what he's doing. So folks, here, here's a lesson. We have to be careful not to demonize or intensely criticize people who disagree with you or us or follow a different spiritual path. But Jesus... See, you get back to my conversation again, which, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay off of, but it keeps coming back. We're so polarized. We think so binary. Everything's right. Everything's wrong. Somebody's got to be right. Someone's got to be wrong. And if, and if this person's right, I'm going to demonize this person. Oh, we've got to stop doing that. The church has got to stop doing that. God blessed them both. Well, how's that possible? He's God. He loves them both. They're not perfect. And so they went their separate ways, still trying to follow Jesus. Not demonizing the other one. Man, I'm glad that's in there. We need that. You know how many times 
Christians say things like, and I've heard it, well, God's just not going to bless them. How do you know what God's going to bless and what he doesn't? Because I've seen some things that I thought he shouldn't bless and he did it anyway. I've probably had a few things where people have been surprised what God blessed in my life too. We just like being right. We like to elevate ourselves over other people. We like to feel self-righteous. That's kind of the pride thing we're going to talk about. Oh, if you were here on Sunday, I told you pride was going to be this Sunday. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I got excited. And I was working on the pride message on Saturday, so it was in my head. Okay. So it's not going to be this Sunday. So forgive me for getting excited and saying it was going. This, this Sunday is on guilt. <laughs> is that better? I don't know. Okay. So... <laughs> Still show up, okay? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> let's just keep moving, huh? So Paul and Silas visit existing churches and, and they encourage. So Paul and Silas now are doing this. Well, Acts 16 is a description of what a normal is normal for a church. I, I love this. Acts 16, 5. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and they grew larger every day. Yep, that's what it's supposed to be. That's normal. That's, that's what we should be aiming for. Healthy churches grow. Healthy churches grow. This is why our focus is on keeping the environment of the church healthy and God takes care of the growth. We just rarely around here set growth goals. And what we want to do is be healthy. Healthy things grow. So I'm emphatic about health. I'm emphatic about people getting along. I'm emphatic about people loving each other. I'm emphatic about people not causing division. You cause division in this church, there's the door. I mean that. There's the door. That's not loving. Yes, it is. It's to protect this environment. You do anything to be divisive. You do things to be unloving. You do things to make the church unhealthy. The environment is everything, folks. This is the environment of the kingdom and in the environment of the kingdom, people's lives are changed. You take the seed of the word of God and you put it in the wrong environment and it does not grow. Environment is, is what brings change. God shows up in the right environment and if the church has the wrong environment, the spirit of God is quenched and grieved and people's lives do not change. Never be part of that, ever. It's not okay. So the churches were strengthened in their faith. They grew larger every day because when churches act that way it's, it's kind of attractive it's kind of attractive you know one of the number one reasons people leave church can't, I can't help it <laughs> one of the number one reasons is the environment number one reasons all the data out there I mean, there's lots of reasons but one of the top reasons are the way that Christians act lack of love lack of environment okay Okay, I'm going to stick to, okay, back here. Here we go. Paul's vision. Number four, Paul's vision to change plans. This gets back to, again, being led. Acts 16. Verses six through 10. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because, now look at this, because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Seriously? The Holy Spirit would not let them go somewhere. Fascinating. Then coming to the borders of Mycenae, they headed north for the province of Bithynia, but again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mycenae to the seaport of Troas. And that night, Paul had a vision from a man from Macedonia in northern Greece, was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. That's good stuff. Notice who's leading them. Again, notice who's leading them. They had a plan, but they were sensitive enough to God for him to redirect their efforts. Wasn't there anything wrong with having a plan? It's, so it's okay to have plans, but we have to have surrendered plans. Lord, this is the best of our ability. We're going to do this. And then what does, what, what does the Holy Spirit do? He leads. He guides. He stops. He redirects. And so they said, oh, we're going to go here. No. Okay, we're going to go here. No. Now what? 
Then he gets a vision. Come, okay, we'll conclude. God wants us to go here. And they go here. It says there, the next bullet point, that the story of Foothills buying our current property. I know that there's a whole story why we bought this grocery store. And I don't have time to go into it, but before we bought the grocery store, I mean, the, the lease was getting so expensive. We knew it was time to buy. It was time to purchase something. It was time to build. We explored buying bare ground. We explored that first, buy bare ground, uh, build something brand new. We knocked on those doors. And we went to those places. We talked to realtors. We explored it and explored it. I cannot tell you all the ways that God said, no, 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 no. It was like, what do you want us to do? You have a grocery store in the middle of town. Really? And I want you to be there. I want you to have a presence. I want you to, the town I want to transform, but I'm going to transform even the physical building you're in because I transform people. I transform buildings. I mean, I transform. I change. Even this building is an example of what I do with a life. It has no purpose. It was, it was broken and, and, and messed up. And yet, look what I've done. I did that with people too. Okay, we'll buy a 60-year-old grocery store, okay? <laughs> and it's worked out pretty good. <laughs> Letting him in lead us. Paul and Silas uh, keep going. They go to Philippi. They get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. They get whipped. They get beaten. They get thrown into the inner dungeon. And, and they, uh, again, quickly, I, I need to move through some of this stuff because I, I do want you to have some time to, to talk. Uh, they, they start singing in the middle of the night, midnight, really? I mean, what, would we be doing that? I mean, we'd be, Lord, I mean, I just followed you. I did what you want. I'm preaching the gospel, and now I'm in jail. I mean, seriously? I did what you want, and my life got worse? So they're singing, and, you know, uh, many people would have concluded they, they missed God's will. Miss, you know, because it got hard. We must be out of, the, out of the will of God. I've heard that one, too. It's really hard to do this. Well, maybe you're not following God's will. Really? Sometimes when you follow God's will, it gets hard. Anyway, so they're singing in the middle of the night. If you don't know the story, I mean, there's, a, there's an earthquake and the, the whole jail is rattled and doors fly open and their chains fall off and the jailer is ready to commit suicide because he thinks all the prisoners left. And Paul says, hey, the world's still here. Why would you stay in jail? All right, the world's still here. And the jailer gets saved and his family gets saved and they're all baptized and there's just, there's, there's a miracle of transformation that takes place in a situation that seemed hopeless and dark. So, Paul, from that Philippi, he, he goes on to a, a place called Athens. And what I want you to see again is Paul's strategy changes. Paul's strategy was to begin a conversation where his audience was at. Find common ground and move forward. Folks, the reason I like this story is because this is how you reach biblically illiterate people for which we are called in this day and age. People do not know the Bible. People aren't even sure if they want to know the Bible. They, they, they don't have any, why do I care about what's in the Bible? And we're in that culture. We're, we're in a modern day Athens and so, um, Acts 17, Acts 17, verse 22. So Paul is in Athens, and you know he sees all the idolatry. He starts talking about the gospel, and, and the Athenians liked new stuff and, and, and new gods and new ways of thinking. And, and so they invited Paul to a place, they call it Mars Hill. I'm going to show you a picture of it here in just a little bit, where, where they could talk about these things. Here's Paul's strategy. So Paul, standing before the council, addresses them as follows. Men of Athens, he says, I noticed that you are very religious, in every way. Let me see all the, see, he starts where they're at, all these idols out there. I mean, so he doesn't start with pounding the Bible, okay? Doesn't start there. I notice that you're very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, your idols. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. And he started where they were at, and he got their attention, and then he launched into talking to them. But he started with common ground. 
So again, usually folks, you don't start with the Bible. You begin with what they understand. You begin with a real need. And then again, there's a strategy for the way we do things on Sunday morning. There is nothing wrong with, with going through the Bible verse by verse and preaching the Bible verse by verse. All of that is good. It is appropriate. I am not here to throw a stone at any other church. Please don't think I'm doing that. I just want you to know that we have a strategy. There is a reason often, most of the time, we start with topics. We, we, start, we start with real life issues. We start with, I, mean, I can't tell you how many people come up to me on a Sunday morning and they go, how do you know? What do you mean, how do I know? How do you know, like, like, what's going on in my life? I don't know what's going on in your life. I'm just dealing with real life issues, and because God's word addresses that, he addresses real life, real life. I, I just want to show you how the word of God addresses that. How the word, I mean, the word of God is like an owner's manual. And, and so you, you can take this and apply it to your life and follow it. So you start with the pain, you start with the frustration, you start with the topic, you start with the real need and go, look what God's word says, relevancy. One of the reasons people are leaving church is because they believe it's irrelevant. All right. Oh, pictures. There I am in Athens. So uh, this picture, by the way, um, this, this little mound here, all the buildings are gone, but that's actually where Paul was, where Paul stood. That's Mars Hill right there. And then uh, behind me is this incredible place called the Acropolis, and uh, that has its own history and stories. And, and again, Athens is, uh, the city itself isn't that impressive, but uh, the ruins there are fantastic. It's kind of fun, again, to uh, stand there right where the Apostle Paul was debating the, the philosophers. So after three years of that, they uh, returned to Antioch. And then we're going to go to the third missionary journey in Acts uh, 18 through 21. So Paul leaves on his third journey, stopping by existing churches and encouraging the saints. So they just, they go back, they retrace their steps, uh, being an encouragement. Paul spends about three years in a place called Ephesus. And so this is the longest period of time Paul spent anywhere, three years in the city. Ephesus was a very influential Roman city. Uh, it was a, excuse me, it was a seaport in the first century. Lisa and I, and it's in Turkey, by the way, Lisa and I, a few years ago, had the privilege of, of going there. It was a rainy, it was rainy that day, but it was still spectacular. The marble walkways, the marble streets, the, the, the columns that lined these roads uh, going into Ephesus. If you, if you uh, look at uh, pictures of Ephesus, this is probably the most famous structure in the book of Ephesus, or the, uh, the, uh, the, the city of Ephesus, which is the library. This is just kind of the frame that's left, but you'll, uh, you'll see that. All these structures that I'm showing you existed while Paul was there. And... Uh, I won't show you pictures of the public restrooms that were there, but my wife, you know, I'd walk by the public restrooms and I, okay, I'll be honest with you. I go, I wonder if Paul peed there, okay, really? <laughs> and Lisa goes, just stop. I go, I don't know, maybe he did. Anyway, so, I did, I said that. <laughs> anyway, well, <laughs> okay, come on back. Yeah. <laughs> So when Paul's there, they, they talk about a marketplace, they talk about an amphitheater, they talk about almost a riot that took place in, in uh, Ephesus. Paul wasn't part of that, but this is the actual marketplace. When the Bible talks about the marketplace and what was going on there, this is it right here. This is the marketplace. And when you, you're there and then you read the account in the book of Acts and the events that took place, man, you can just visualize it because this uproar took place in this marketplace and, and then people dragged some of the believers into, into the amphitheater that was just right around the corner. And then we came around the corner, boom, there's this amphitheater. And they filled up the amphitheater and it's like, you know, these men are doing this. And there was an uproar for hours that was taking place. And they finally got the officials in the city to calm everybody down because they, they said, listen, if you guys don't calm down, listen, the Romans are going to come in here and we don't want the Romans coming in and causing us problems. And so, but that's where all these events, when you read through this story, took place right there. 
So, okay. Um, Paul intends now after this, this the end of this third missionary journey, he wants to go back to Jerusalem. He's warned not to go. By this time, see, he's, he's been going for years. He's been traveling and, and people have been giving their life to Jesus. Paul has developed a reputation as somebody who is telling people to not follow the Jews' way of life. And he's making enemies with the Jews. So he returns to Jerusalem anyway. He is immediately arrested in the temple. And uh, again, they say, this is the man who's telling people to not follow the Old Testament law. And there's just huge uproar. And they want to stone Paul. They want to kill Paul. And so the Roman soldiers show up because there's this, again, this is on the Temple Mount, by the way. This is all happening up on top of the Temple Mount. I've shown you some pictures of the Temple Mount. And they're, they're, they're wanting to just tear Paul apart. And it was so intense that the soldiers had to pick Paul up over their heads and, and move him towards the barracks. And there's a staircase that I'm going to show you here. And I think, is the next one the video? I can't, okay. They're not timed, but who cares? So at the, at the, the top of the Temple Mount, at the, at one end there were barracks where the soldiers were. And, and so this is just a little bit of where that those barracks would have been, those stairs going up. And, you know, they, they took Paul up out of the crowd. They took Paul up so that people couldn't, you know, get to him. So you just imagine there's, there's thousands of people in that area and they're grabbing Paul. They're putting Paul on his, on, up above their heads. They're getting him up on those stairs that I showed you. And then Paul, you know, tries to, hey, you know, can I address people? And so they let Paul talk to everybody. And that whole scene that you read where Paul gets arrested by the Romans on the Temple Mount, that's what you're just seeing. It happened right there. So again, kind of fascinating. They, uh, again, so Paul is arrested. He is imprisoned. And this is kind of how the end of Acts is, is gonna finish. So while he's there, a plot is uncovered. Uh, to, to kill Paul and because again they don't want to see him move so they move him by night to Caesarea and you've seen pictures of that that's Herod's complex seaport that he created Paul is tried by three different rulers why he's there Felix Festus and King Agrippa and he's there for quite some time his his his, his trial never really moves forward he's just kind of in limbo so to avoid any injustice in his trial, Paul exercises his right as a Roman citizen to appeal his case directly to Caesar himself. I want to see Caesar. And so it's like, well, Paul, to Caesar you will go. And so Paul is sent to Rome and he is in prison for two years. And again, these are the last couple of chapters in the book of, the book of Acts. Paul is imprisoned. He still has a lot of influence though. He's, a, he's allowed to see people. He, he is allowed to teach. He writes what's called the prison epistles during this time, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He writes those books during those times while he's in prison. Church tradition says that Paul was eventually beheaded, which would have been the normal way to execute a Roman citizen. Soon after Paul was executed, so about the end of the book of Acts, Jerusalem and the Temple Mount complex is destroyed by the Romans, by General Titus. And so the, the Jews rebel, the Roman army shows up, and they, they destroy Jerusalem. Over one million Jews, they say, were killed in that, and over 200,000 Jews were taken captive. What we see in Rome, Lisa and I were in Rome a few years ago in 2016. This is the Arch of Titus. And so this, the Arch of Titus commemorates his great victory in Jerusalem. And so they brought back the Jewish captives on the relief. This is, is part of the relief on these arches. These arches are telling a story. And so you have the Jewish captives. You have the, the, the Manoah up here. That they're bringing back on their shoulders that, that would have been in the, in the temple. Um, and if you didn't know this, there, okay, beside, I mean, that is the Roman Colosseum. But I, I got to tell you this, when Lisa and I were in Rome, we stayed at an Airbnb that was like 100 yards from the Colosseum. I mean, we like looked out and there was a Colosseum. It was, it, was like, it was a building that was built in 900 AD. 
It was just incredible. Rome is an incredible place to go. Jewish captives built this. That's how that Colosseum was built. Titus brought back these uh, Jewish captives and, uh, and they were used to actually build the Colosseum. So the book of Acts kind of ends with Paul in prison. The book of Acts ends with the, the church, though, flourishing, growing throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, it, it doesn't describe the fall of Jerusalem, but it's imminent. It's only a few, it's only a few years uh, from, from happening. And, and, and then what happens at the end of the book of Acts is we're going to move on from there. And we're going to talk about the epistles and what, what the word epistle means letter. And so Paul and Peter and James, and, you know, and there, there were these people who wrote letters to the churches and we're going to spend next week talking about those letters that were written to encourage the saints that, that uh, were existing in those, those, those startup churches all over the Roman Empire. That's next week. Whew, there we go. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we went through a lot really quick. But I want to thank you again for your word, for the story of your church, and that your Holy Spirit is still leading your church. You're still leading it, Lord. I pray that we would listen. I pray that you would help us have ears to hear, eyes to see. And, and Lord, a, a heart and a will to follow you. Lord, that is the path of blessing. That's the only way your church is going to have a, an impact in this world, is if we follow you. You know who we need to be, how we represent you. You will give us the wisdom to change strategy. You'll give us the wisdom to know how to talk to a new generation. You'll show us how to talk to people, Lord, who have no knowledge of the word of God or you. You'll show us how to love people into your kingdom. So Lord, we need you for this. You've called us to it. And Lord, we want to just follow. So thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.